Hey, howdy everyone. I'm reporting from a different location today. I was working from home and I thought I'd put together a quick lecture on Krigging. And so this is my office at home. And so last time we got into the issues around trend modeling, we were building trend models in order to take and decompose the total variability of a spatial system into two buckets. On one side we had that which was trend and considered known and it was typically non-stationary. We would have a non-stationary mean or variance or whatever the statistic was we would model it. Then what we would do is we would then have a residual and if we're talking about a mean it's very straightforward. We just take the data value, subtract the trend, we get a residual. And the residual will now be stationary and we can go ahead and try to model that using our geostatistical methods. The trend is considered known, the residual is considered not known or unknown, and we will use statistical, geostatistical methods to try to figure that out. So we have removed the trend, we're working with the residual, and we're ready to do some Krieging. Krieging for the purpose of making estimates in space. So what does spatial estimation look like? Well, let's go ahead and take a very simple example and illustrate it. Consider this situation. We have this area of interest delineated by this oval type shape here. And we have data points 1, 2, and 3. At those locations 1 through 3, we have data available to us so we know what's going on. Now the problem we have is that we would like to know what's going on at this unknown location right here. We want to understand what's going on at this location. We have not sampled that location. So at the data locations 1, 2, and 3, we have Z measured. It's not a random variable. It's a data point, so we show it in low caps, lower caps. We have our usual location vector U in bold. It's a vector. Location 1, 2, and 3, those are our three data at the three data locations. The Z could be any variable of interest. It could be porosity. It could be permeability. For most of the discussion today, why don't we just assume that we're dealing with porosity? So, now we're going to try to make an estimate at this unknown location. How are we going to do that? Well, there's many ways we could do it. A very convenient way to do it would be to form an estimator that looks like this. Now, when we say Z star, we're talking about the variable of interest at the unknown location star means an estimate. U naught, because we're dealing with the unknown location, we'll just call it naught or zero. And so when we think about making an estimator, this is a very logical way to do it. What we have here is an equation where we're taking the sum of, for each of the data, one through n, there's three data available to us. We have a weight that's assigned to each of the data, Lambda is the weight, and Z, or Z I should say, is the data values at those locations. So we're just weighting the data with a linear weighted average of the data effectively, or linear weighted estimator of all of the data. So far so good. But we could be concerned about biasness. And we could imagine that if in fact the sum of the weights is less than 1 or greater than 1, we could imagine that we would actually be adding bias to the system. How do we count for that? We take this term right here. We just simply say, take the sum of the weights to the data, and we're going to take one minus that. So the remainder, in order to get us up to a sum of weights equals to one, and we'll put that weight on the global mean. That's a very straightforward way to do it. It does provide us with unbiasedness, and so it's useful. Now you could also imagine there might be a circumstance in which we don't think this data is useful for this unknown location. And in that case, we could imagine the sum of the weights being very low. And it would make sense that much of our remaining weight, or that large remaining weight, would be applied then to the global mean. So this makes sense. It's a pretty rational type of an estimator to work with. Now, of course, we want to account for the fact that we're dealing with a phenomenon that is usually non-stationary. Many things we work with non-stationary. The mean is changing locally. The proportion is changing locally. So if we go back to the mean, we could imagine that what we could do is just recast this equation, but in from the perspective of 
residuals, a residual workflow. And so we have Z estimate, but at the estimate location, this location here, we subtract the mean at that location. And we have the data, and at the data locations, we subtract the means at the data locations. And so you can see there that we're working with residuals at each location. And so you could imagine that given that we could say Y residual is equal to whatever the Z value is minus the local mean. And if you do that, this entire equation shrinks down and just now it looks very simple. Y star at unknown location, the estimate of the residual, we know the mean, so we'll have the full estimate given the mean again, is equal to the sum of the weights applied to all of the residuals at the data locations. And so we're fine. We now have an estimator that we can work with. And you can confirm for yourself that this actually now is also accounting for that unbiasedness constraint. In fact, we will still have the sum of the weights being applied to the mean. And if you think about its intrinsic here, because of the fact that when we work with residuals, the mean is now zero. So whatever weight is not applied to the data is in fact being applied to a zero mean. And so everything's working out. We got unbiasedness, we're working with residuals, we can account for non-stationarity. We feel pretty good about that. So now the question comes up. How are we going to get the weights? And so let's just look at this problem right here. What would be the weights that you would want to apply? What would be the criteria that you would use to decide on the weight or the relative weights between each one of the data values? Data point one and two are both very close to the unknown location. Data point three is much further away. Would we want to give data point three less weight than one and two? It makes sense that closeness is going to matter. Now, what about the fact that data point one and two are very close to each other? Does that affect the weight that you give to each of them? What if data point two was on the other side the same distance away? Would it get more weight and would data point one have more weight then? What if I drilled four, five, and six right here? Would they continue to get the same weight as one, two, and three, or would they impact the weights? It seems that data redundancy should also matter. And then finally, what if I told you the direction of spatial continuity was like this, that there was much greater spatial continuity here, and very poor spatial continuity in this direction here. This is a minor, this is a major direction of continuity. In that case, we might see data point three getting more weight than one and two, even together. And so what's that telling us? We want to account for closeness. We want to account for redundancy of the data. We also would want to account for spatial continuity in coming up with these weights. So weighting schemes we could propose, equal weighted, equal weighted on all the data, we could do that. Equal weighting would just simply be the weight is equal to one divided by the number of data. That of course would not be very satisfactory. That would not account for any of the things we just talked about. So it wouldn't account for closeness, redundancy, or spatial continuity. So we're gonna just throw that out. We're not gonna do that. What about inverse distance? In fact, many people know about inverse distance weighting. It's commonly used for interpolation in spatial problems where we have some type of sparse data. The methodology is very straightforward. The weight is simply one divided by the distance between the data point and the unknown location raised to a power. And that power is giving you sensitivity of distance. If you use a power of three, you say high sensitivity to distance. And as an impact of that is if we made an inverse distance map from this data, that we would see huge influence of data point number two in this area, much less from data point one and three, and your model becomes more locally specific, less averaged, more bullseyes within the model. If you use a power of one, it's got a lot less sensitivity to distance. And as a result of that, you would see much more smooth type of behavior, a lot less locally specific to the data around you. Now, this part of dividing by the sum of the weights is just to ensure it's a standardization to make sure that the sum of the weights is equal to one. What's the problem with this? It's accounting for closeness, not accounting for redundancy, and not accounting for spatial continuity at all directions of spatial continuity or anything like that. So it's not a great method to use either. So we want something that can account for closeness, redundancy, 
and also spatial continuity, concepts of spatial continuity. How are we going to do that? Well, let's go ahead and pose a new construct. We're going to take our linear system, our, our system of estimation here based on weights, apply to all of the data with the residuals to get the estimate of the residual. So far, so good. We know about that. And then we're going to define estimation variance. Estimation variance will come up many times. It'll come up when we talk about machine learning. And in estimation variance is very straightforward. It's the expectation of the estimate minus the true, not available, but true value at the unknown location. And we're going to square that. And so this becomes a variance. If it's centered on zero, it's just a variance. So we have estimation variance. And what's very cool about this, we know how to work with expect expectation. It's very simple. We got a quadratic. We can expand the quadratic. We expand the quadratic. We get, of course, y star u squared. We got this other term here, which is the unknown value squared. And then we have this product term here. Now, what's very cool is for each one of the y star estimates, we know the equation that we use to get it. It's a sum of the weights applied to the data. And so we can substitute that into the equation. And when we do that, we get these terms right here. Now, what's very cool about this now is if you look at this term right here, we got a double sum, double the weights. So we're now going to be summing over the data with themselves, comparing all combinations of the data and their weights. So far, so good. But this term right here is the expectation of data located at index i data located at index j and if you think about it that is if we consider it centered with a mean of zero again that is equal to the covariance between data at location i and data at location j we can substitute the covariance in there this term right here we got a single sum which is going to be over all of the data with the unknown location and so if we look at this, the expectation of the unknown location times the data, this is, in fact, if we assume once again a mean of zero, is going to be the covariance of the unknown location with the data. And this term, the remaining term, simplifies for us. It turns out that it's simply going to be the variance of the problem. Because we're just simply looking at the variability of at all of the unknown locations is simply going to be the variability of the problem. That's just simply a variance. And so we have a variance term here. We'll denote it since we're using covariance as the covariance at the zero distance, which is equal to the sill, which is equal to the variance. Okay, so this is what we get. We get for the estimation variance or the performance of our estimator, we're going to get a value here, which is this, this component here, which is the redundancy component right there. Then what we have is we have, and, and look, it's redundancy. We're simply looking at the covariances between all of the data with each other. So it's accounting for all of the combinations of data and how they're correlated to each other or what the covariance is between each other. This term right here is the covariance between the unknown location and all the data. This is a summary of the closeness of the data to the unknown location. And this component is the variance. And this makes sense because if you have a problem for which the variance is very large, you would expect systematically for the estimation variance to have a potential to go higher. And if you have very small variance of the problem, well, it's an easy thing to estimate. The estimation variances are going to be uniformly low. So we've got estimation variance. Now we're engineers, and so what are we going to do? We want to find the weights that will minimize the estimation variance. If we do that, we could all agree that that would be the best weights to use. We want to minimize estimation variance, have the best estimate possible. And so we take that former equation, and we apply the partial differential of it relative to the weights. And if we do that, there's, a, there's some derivations we're skipping over, of course, for the purpose of this course. They're available in the standard textbooks. Um, you could find them within the Perch and Deutsch book, of course, Gouverts. I'm sure it's in Journal's book and so forth. 
maybe in um, Stravastava and Isaac's book. You'll find that this will actually simplify to this equation right here, a summation of the weights multiplied by the covariances in the redundancy term, minus two times the covariances between the data and the unknown location. And so what does this result in? It results in a system of equations. We've got n equations, n unknowns. This is the simple Kriging system. Now, let's go ahead and define Kriging really quick, and then we'll go ahead and look at it in matrix form, which I think is much more efficient. And so what do we have here? We have Kriging is defined as an estimation approach that relies on linear weights that account for spatial continuity, data closeness, and redundancy. The weights are unbiased. The estimator is unbiased, and it minimizes the estimation variance. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at it in matrix form. We had system of equations. Let's go back to our problem with three data, one, two, and three here. We got an unknown location right here, two-dimensional problem. If we look at the system of equations, we're going to have a weight applied to the covariance between data point one and itself, weight two, data point one and two, and so forth, all the way to the covariance between the unknown location and data point one, and you carry that through through data one, two, and three, three equations. Now, you might be wondering about how we got covariances. We modeled the variogram. You can recall from the previous lectures on spatial continuity, we talked about the fact that the variogram can be directly related to the covariance by the sill. Covariance at h is equal to the sill or variance minus the variogram at h. And so we can take this system of equations and, and look at it with a matrix form, and what do we get? The left-hand side of the system is the covariances between all of the data and themselves. This is really cool because this part of the matrix, this, this part is, this matrix, I should say, captures all of the information about pairwise redundancy between the data. This side is the covariances between the data and the unknown location. It captures all the closeness. And this array, this matrix right here is simply, or vector is just simply the weights that we're trying to solve for. How are we going to solve for it? We populate the covariances using our positive definite spatial continuity model. Then we invert the left-hand side, multiply it with matrix multiplication by the right-hand side, calculate the weights. Very simple. You could do it in Excel. It'd be very straightforward. So what are some of the properties of simple creep? First of all, if the covariance model that we're using to describe the spatial behavior of the phenomenon of interest is positive definite, there will be a solution. There will be a unique solution to that matrix system. We can go ahead and calculate the optimum creaking estimate and the associated estimation variance or error variance. The creaking estimator is unbiased. If we take the estimation, or, sorry, the expectation over all of the locations, the data minus the estimate at, or the true value minus the estimate, we'll find that, in fact, that's equal to zero. It's unbiased as an estimate. We know already, we talked about a little bit about the derivation, that we expect it to be a minimum error variance estimator, that the weights are solved for that minimize the error variance. Now, in case you don't believe this, go ahead, just try to pick weights. Go and just pick weights, anything different than what Cregan gives you, calculate, recalculate the error variance, and you're going to find out that it's always going to be higher. So we call it the best linear unbiased estimator because of these general properties. Now, the thing about Cregan, Cregan's very cool because Cregan's like a good friend. The good friend that gives you a good estimate of something tells you what they think is going on, but also says, how bad is their estimate? They're very honest about the estimate they're giving you. So if you take the previous error variance equation and you substitute in it the constraints from the simple Kriging system, you get this nice tidy equation right here, which will tell you what is the, we'll call it the Kriging variance. Or we can also call it the estimation variance. And this is an assessment of how good your estimate, your Krieged estimate is at an unknown location. Very, very powerful.
The other point, too, is it's an exact interpolate. In other words, at the data locations, Kriging is going to give you the data value at the data location. Another point we should make is that the Kriging, the Kriging variance can be calculated before you actually have data. This is very powerful. That's because it's homoscedastic. The Kriging variance doesn't depend on the values at the locations. It simply depends on the fact that you have data at those locations. So if we go back to this example that we kept looking at, we could go ahead and say, well, what, what would be the uncertainty at this location? Given these three data, you could calculate it with the Kriging system. That's fine. But you could say, what if I had data here? What if I drill this well right here? Or if I sample with a drill hole or a soil sampler, whatever is in space. If I take a sample here, how will it impact uncertainty here? With the Kriging system, you could calculate the change in the Kriging variance without knowing the data value here because it's homoscedastic. It doesn't depend on the data value. Now, of course, if you get a new data value right here, and you find that it contradicts your trend model, or if it changes your spatial continuity concept, of course, that's a whole different situation. What else can we say? Kriging takes into account distance from the information, that the um, right-hand side of the equation, the system. We got the left-hand side that accounts for the redundancy within the data and accounts for the spatial continuity because you're using covariances. Kriging smooths. In fact, if I was to calculate Kriging estimates at multiple locations here, 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 and here, and here, they would all be very similar to each other, probably. They would be very smooth taken jointly. That's because at each location, Kriging is trying to give you the very best estimate at each location. It's not trying to give you the right spatial continuity. It's not trying to honor the global distribution of the porosity or whatever property we're working with. It's just trying to solve the problem of getting one best estimate at a time. What's that mean? It means that Kriging is too smooth. And the cool thing about it is you actually know how too smooth it is. And we can use that when we get to simulation to correct for it. One more comment or a couple more comments about Kriging. If the data is all outside the range of spatial continuity from the unknown location, the simple Kriging weights will all equal zero. And the best estimate, if we take the sum of zero times all of the data values, we get zero. You can estimate with zero for the residual, add back in the trend. You're estimating with the local mean, the trend model. Or if you have a stationary phenomenon, the global mean. We also have an interesting thing about Kriging, and that is you can screen data. So I give you a one-dimensional example where we have data at locations here, 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 and here. And let's just consider the two closest data to this unknown location right here. So this is where we're trying to estimate. What's very interesting is if we were to go ahead and calculate the Kriging weights, we would find out that this would probably have a positive weight here, but this data closer to the unknown location and in 1D, it's perfectly screening the data behind it. We might expect negative weight on location number three. What does that mean? Well, if we're working with residuals like the residual V shale mean of zero, these would be negative data values. Multiply a negative weight, you get a positive value. When you get a positive value times the value here, if you sum this all up, you can actually extrapolate outside the range of the data. Kriging can extrapolate through negative weights. Negative weights happen because data is screened. Another way to think about screening in 2D would be if you were to imagine that you have a situation like this, and you have an unknown location right here, and you have data value here, you could imagine screening kind of like you're shining a light from the unknown location. And so any data that falls back here is being screened by this data value right here. And so that's another way to think about screening. All right. Another interesting property of screening is known as the string effect. If you have a string of data, and we often do in the subsurface because we sample data along drill holes and wells and so forth. If you have a string of data, and you're estimating an unknown location away from it, 
you can have the possibility of having a distribution of weights look like this. Typically, it's not this bad. It'll be like a spike here, then a mound here, spike here. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that you might have more weight here because this data value is closer to that. Maybe even spatial continuity is greater in that direction. Closeness. But remember, Krieging also considers data redundancy. And to Krieging, which doesn't know that there's a boundary, doesn't know that perhaps this is the top of the layer, this is the bottom of the layer, it might not know that. And so Krieging just sees this data value and this data value as being the least redundant data values and they can perhaps receive more weight. Programs that use Krieging in them will typically limit the number of data per well to try to avoid this problem. Okay, let's go ahead, demonstrate Krieging in Excel, and we're going to go ahead and play around with it and look at some different configurations. If you go on GitHub, Geostat Guy, you will find a sheet just like this called Simple Krieging Demo. It's in my Excel numerical demo repository. And so what we can do here is we can vary all of the fields in yellow to change the problem. So the data locations are shown here. The unknown location is here. If I want to move the data values around, I can go ahead and just type in new numbers here, and you can see it jumped around. I arbitrarily just gave it data values. I just decided to use the global mean from the mean of the data. Three data is not enough to get a mean, but I just did that for the demonstration. We get residuals. We're doing residuals. Take all of the data locations, work out the distance matrix. Distance between the data and themselves, the diagonal is going to be zero because that's data one with data one, data two with data two, and so forth. This is the distance between the data and the unknown location. This is the varigram model. Now I kept this sheet very simple. There's nugget, there's spherical structure. You're allowed just one structure, isotropic with a range 300. Data size is 100 by 100. And then the covariance matrix is calculated directly from the distance matrix using the Veragram model. We invert the left-hand side, multiply it by the right-hand side to get the weights. We get the sum of the weights. We get the weight that's assigned to the mean, which is 1 minus the sum of the weights. And from that, we get the Krieging estimate and the Krieging estimation variance. So let's try a couple of things. This will be kind of fun. So the first thing we can try to do, we take that one data point that we just moved, we can move it back. Why don't we put it kind of close to data point number two? We could do that by saying, okay, 25, and then we can move it down to 60. Okay, so just take a look at the weights right now, and when we do that, look what happens. You notice that data point number two dropped in weight. This data point here then increased in weight, but it's like they're sharing the same weight everything has become equal weighted. Okay, so this is very interesting. It's almost like it's equal weighted. Why is that? These are closer to this unknown location, but they're redundant with each other. This is further away. Remember, the problem is isotropic. And so they're all getting the same weight because redundancy is knocking down the weight here. Closeness is kind of poor for this one, so it knocks it down for that one there too. And so that's kind of interesting. Now, what we could do that's kind of cool is we could go ahead and try moving this data closer. So now let's move it in just a little bit. So if we move it to 75, we'll have the same distance. So now we have the same distance away. And what's happened? This is very interesting. We have, if you look at the sum of the weights right here, they're just a little bit larger than the single weight given to this data. It's accounting for the fact that they're redundant. Okay, let's try something else. Let's go ahead and take data point number one. Let's move it over, and then let's move it down. What happened? Let's even move it in a little bit closer, I think. What if we bring it all the way into 20? Okay. So if you look right now, we put this data value, number one, right behind number two. Number three is over here. The weight on data point number one is negative. It's starting to screen. Data point two is screening data point number one, and so it's gone negative. That's very cool. Let's go ahead and we'll move that back. Let's get it out of there and put it back, I don't know, around there. And we can move it in just a little bit closer. 
Okay, now let's decrease the barogram range so everything starts to go out of range. What happened? We have a 50 meter range. We've still got this stuff, these data in range, but they are getting less weight. If you look at the sum of the weights, now it's equal to 0.8. The sum of the weights that are, the mi one minus the sum of the weights that's applied to the global mean is almost 0.2. Let's decrease the range again. Ah, it's 20 now. So now all of the data are out of range. The sum of the weights is equal to zero. None of the data is informative about the unknown location. And the weight given to the mean is equal to one. The Krieging estimate is the global mean. And the Krieging variance is equal to the SIL, the nugget effect component plus the spherical st structure, which means the uncertainty is equal to the total uncertainty of the problem, to the variance of the problem. All right. This spreadsheet, once again, simple Kriging demo, is available in Excel numerical demos within the Geostack Guy um, GitHub repositories. Okay, so I just put a couple of exercises here. We just did them. I think it's very useful to explore and get experiential learning with Kriging. That's why I put it in Excel so people can just try it out learn the, and feel, kind of get a sense of how Kriging behaves. I think that's very powerful. Okay, so what's next? Now, there's a different type of Kriging, which is called ordinary Kriging. And with ordinary Kriging, what we do is we say, let's add an additional constraint. Let's say that the sum of the weights must equal to one. That's a pretty reasonable thing to do. If you do that, what happens is that you just have to expand the system of equations. You have this component here, which is just saying, if you do matrix math, saying weight one plus weight two plus weight three is equal to one. That's all it's saying. So it's very straightforward. Now, what's very cool, if the weights, the sum of the weights is constrained to equal to one, if we go back to original estimator here, and we look at before we did the residual removal and all that, we would realize that if all the sum of the weights is equal to one, you don't, you no longer need to know the global mean. In fact, what ordinary Kriging does, it estimates the local mean, the, um, the mean locally from the available data. And so this is very powerful. What does it mean? Ordinary Kriging relaxes the assumption of stationarity of the mean. It estimates the mean locally within the local window using the available data. Okay, let's just make some points about Kriging. Kriging is the procedure for constructing minimum error variance linear estimate at a location where the true value is unknown. It's a spatial estimator. The main controls on the Kriging weights, closeness, redundancy, and the varigram. Simple Kriging does not constrain the weights, works well for residual from the mean or local trend mean, but assumes stationarity. So you've got to work with a residual that's going to be stationary or work with something that doesn't have any trends in it. Ordinary Kriging constrains sum of the weights to equal to one. Therefore, the mean does not need to be known. It relaxes the assumption of stationarity. It locally is estimating the mean and then making the estimate based on that. Many different types of Kriging, generally they vary by the way that they deal with stationarity. Some include methodologies that actually try to estimate the trend model at the same time as estimating the optimum weights. We won't cover that right now. Two implicit assumptions are stationarity. We talked about already that in some cases we work with residuals like simple Kriging. We'd want to most of the time work with a residual. And in other cases like ordinary Kriging, we relax stationarity a bit. We allow the mean to locally vary. Ergodicity is also an important concept. It's a bit complicated, but it gets down to the idea that the space over which we are estimating is large relative to the correlation range. Kriging, and, and it results in the stability of the statistics that we're working with. It'll be more important when we talk about simulation methods. Kriging is not used directly to map a spatial distribution of an attribute. It can, sometimes we'll do it when we have something that's very smooth, and, or we just need to work with interpolations. But we admit that Kriging is too smooth. It's just giving us the local best estimate. We can build a, a map of that but we got to be careful because it's not representing the right 
total distribution, the right total variance, and it doesn't actually reproduce the right spatial continuity. If you took a Krieged map and calculate the distribution or the spatial continuity, it'd be way too low variance, and it would also be way too smooth. The spatial continuity, short range continuity would be very smooth. This all gets corrected soon in simulation. So I have an example where I have, I have a workflow in R for doing Krieging. I will go ahead and record that as a separate lecture and talk through that. I think that's a very useful opportunity. I will also talk about methodologies for using GSLive and I will show some Python too. So in summary, we've just covered Krieging. The next recorded lectures will include illustrations or demonstrations of Krieging. And then after that, we'll get into simulation. As usual, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or to discuss geostats at any time. You may reach me by email, or you can reach me, of course, through Twitter. I'm the geostats guy on Twitter. I hope this has been helpful to you. All right, take care.